Hello, everybody. It is really a privilege to be here. I'm honored and um, both stimulated and maybe just a little bit intimidated by all of the discussion of constitutional law. Since as I have uh, freely told everybody, what I know about constitutional law, you could uh, put on the head of a pin. So, uh, but I am very glad to be here. And I'm also glad to be here in Black History Month uh, because I think the perspective I'm speaking from is really from the perspective of a black Christian woman. And I am honored that the Center for Constitutional Studies would invite me. And I want to thank Professor Brogdon and S Professor Scott, Professor Burton, and of course the excellent staff who did so much to make it possible for us to be here. Thank you all very much. The other thing I should mention is, you know, this is my second time in the sort of Salt Lake City region in two months. Yeah, I was here in December for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's Christmas concert. So I feel, and ev all of the Mormons that I have met are just the nicest people. So much so that I think maybe you guys are trying to convert me or something. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm a fiery Pentecostal. I am the daughter of the high octane, low church wing of Christianity, filled with the Holy Spirit and that with a mighty burning power. So. Uh, and besides, my Catholic friends would all get jealous if I converted. Um, but I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about uh, a kind of different take on religious freedom, something I've called an acted religious freedom. You know, religious freedom, as we've been talking about here, is a lot about laws, lawsuits, uh, and what's often in the news is Who's go who can you bake a cake for, who can you refuse to bake a cake for, or build a website for, or the ministerial exception. But I want to suggest that there's a different way to think about religious freedom. And then I want to talk about the champions of religious freedom and the causes that they're kind of associated with in the uh, public mind. Because Rob Robert asked me to talk about culture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about culture what we're seen as being as supporting, and what we might want to think about supporting in order to demonstrate to the public the importance of religious commitment. I wanted, I've called it enacted religious freedom. And I wrote a piece on this uh, for the St. Thomas Journal of Law, and I found that my editor kept asking me, so what exactly is it? So forgive me if I come back to it time and time again to try and make clear what I'm talking about. I'm suggesting that when you get up on whichever day it is, if you are a person of faith, and you get up on whatever day it is, whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday or on a, any other day of the week, and you go and practice religion, you are assuming religious freedom. You're assuming that you have the right to do that, that you have the freedom to do that. If you lived in North Korea, you wouldn't make that assumption. You wouldn't assume that you had the freedom to act on your religion. And so that's the underlying idea I want to talk about. When I first arrived in the United States, so I think some of you may have heard that I'm a Jamaican, born and raised. When I came to the United States and discovered that you could get exemptions on the basis of your religious commitment. So for example, I was a manager at Boston City Hospital and one of my employees came to me and said, you know, I don't work on, fr on Good Friday because of my religious commitment. I didn't know that I was obliged to let this man not work because that just isn't the way it works in Jamaica. Now in Jamaica, Good Friday is actually a holiday as was Ash Wednesday, but if you were a minority religion, if you were a Rastafarian and you came and made claims on the basis of your Rastafarian religion, you were not going to be accommodated. But in 2010, Beckett Law gave the prize of the Canterbury Medal to my dear friend, Robbie George. Some of you may know him. Uh, 
the famous Robert P. George from Princeton University. And my husband and I attended, and there was such a diversity of religions, and I was a little puzzled. Deep down in my heart, I'm a little bit of a fundamentalist Christian, and I was like, what is all of these different religions? I was taken aback. And Robbie said to me, if we do not defend the right of every single person to believe or not believe, then no one's faith can be valid. Everyone must be free to choose entirely for him or herself. We cannot coerce religion. And with that, I was converted. Converted to the need for us to defend and protect religious freedom so that everyone can make that decision for him or herself. I wanted to talk about how enacted religious freedom has looked in the black community in particular. So in the abolition of slavery was a huge example of how people enacted their religious freedom. Harriet Tubman made 13 trips and ferried dozens of enslaved people to freedom in the North. She spoke out against slavery and for abolition, and all of it was motivated by a profound faith in God. She had the confidence that though she had suffered a head wound which caused her to black out at unexpected times, God was leading her, he was guiding her, he was the motivation for what she was doing. She was enacting, she was carrying out her religious freedom, despite living in a time of slavery. Sojourner Truth was another example of a Christian who acted out of her religious conviction and traveled widely, giving anti-slavery lectures, and also standing up for uh, women's rights and challenging, challenging racist notions about black people at their very root by demonstrating her ability, her rhetorical skills, challenging the very grounds on which slavery stood, the assumption that blacks were subhuman. White abolitionists did the same thing. William Lloyd Garrison, and so many of the white abolitionists were acting on religious commitments, making religious arguments on the basis of their deeply held faith. But it wasn't just in abolition that we see this enacted religious uh, freedom. The founding of the first black denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, was the same kind of motivated uh, a religiously motivated action. So the Great Awakening had an incredible impact on enslaved people in the South. Prior to that, not very many of them had converted to Christianity. And slaveholders were always ambivalent about whether or not they wanted slaves exposed to Christianity. Because on one hand, there was a doctrine of slaves obey your masters. But on the other hand, there was a great liberating theme running from Exodus through Revelation about how God sets his people free. And in the Great Awakening for the first time, evangelicals were preaching to enslaved and free black people, telling them about the gospel, evangelizing them, and they responded in droves. At the same time, because of all of the revolutionary rhetoric surrounding uh, the founding of the nation and the Revolutionary War, many of the northern states were enacting uh, gradual abolition of slavery. And so black people flooded into Philadelphia. And one of them was a former slave who took the name, his name was Richard, and he took the name Richard Allen. And Allen comes to Philadelphia and all of that radical equality I'd been talking about, there were even slaves pastoring white churches. The level of equality was so radical. And in some cases, in, in, in one case, one of the uh, slaveholders wrote about a, a slave that he was raised in a family of religious persons commonly called Methodists and has lived with some of them for years past on terms of perfect equality 
The refusal to continue him on those terms has led to his running away. Really radical equality, well, it didn't last. As the numbers of black people flooded into Philadelphia, Richard Allen goes to the Methodist Episcopal Church, St. George's, the largest church in the city, and there, after a period of time, he starts evangelizing black people, bringing them into the church, and then as numbers grow, the white parishioners begin to grumble, and they decide they must segregate. They construct a gallery, and they, sometime about 1792 or 93, require that blacks be seated in the gallery rather than integrated seating in the main floor. And black people come in, and some historians think that Allen actually precipitates this. He kneels, he leads everyone to the middle of the uh, church, the black people, and they kneel down for prayer. And the white deacons come around and try to pull them off of their knees in the middle of prayer to reseat them. And as soon as the person leading prayer finished the prayer, Alan leads the entire group out of the church to establish Bethel Methodist Church, also known as Mother Bethel, still standing in Philadelphia. Well, sub, you know, a couple of buildings later, but still on the same site. It's established in 1794, but over the next two decades, the white Methodists try to take possession of the church. They actually trick Allen and his congregation in the founding documents, writing the documents in such a way, the Articles of Incorporation, that give the Methodist, the white Methodists control. Allen responds by coming up with an African supplement that wrests control back to the black congregation whereupon the white Methodists sell the building out from under him, but Allen was an incredible businessman and actually had the money, over $180,000 in 2022 dollars, in cash to buy back his building. And finally, they take him to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, take the whole congregation to get control, the white Methodists do, to get control of the church. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court finds in favor of the black congregation and Bethel Church is finally free of the Methodist Conference. Very soon after that, Allen calls a conference of Methodists from Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, who have been suffering this um, from, uh, who have been suffering the same experiences, the same kind of racist treatment, and they found the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the denomination, which, according to uh, one of the leading um, historians of the period, Albert Rabato, was the most important denomination and arguably the most important African-American institution for most of the 19th century. Richard Allen and his congregation were using their freedom as religious people to resist oppression. That was enacted religious freedom. The civil rights movement is another powerful example of this enacted religious freedom. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference lead the camp, well, uh, SCLC didn't uh, yet begin, didn't yet exist, but he's one of the leaders, King is one of the leaders of the Montgomery Improvement Association in 1955 when Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat, black residents boycott the buses, they walk to work, for 12 months, they refused to take the buses, they developed carpools, and they successfully desegregate the bus service. But what was the key? They would meet in churches at night, they would sing, they would pray, they would listen to rousing sermons, they were motivated by their faith. They believed that God was doing for them something that he had done for the Israelite slaves in Exodus. But that, uh, King does the same thing in Birmingham, Alabama, along with the Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference, where they are working to desegregate retail establishments, and they eventually get to the point where they're able to 
remove all uh, of the segregation signs. They're able to get a commitment to work for better jobs for black people and to establish a committee that would monitor the success of these efforts. Tragically, the KKK struck back and we have the bombing of the church in Birmingham where four young girls are killed. But what gave them the strength to endure all of this was their faith. In 1965, they lead the Selma to Montgomery March with John Lewis and the Student Nonviolent, uh, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were fighting for voting rights for people. I think all of us know about the horrible massacre that happens on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but they endure, they come back, and in two weeks later, they complete the march and actually win the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They were exercising their faith, they were acting on their religious commitments, they were enacting their religious freedom. And by doing so, they ended the terror of the Jim Crow South. Yale Stephen Carter says, ordinary black people believe profoundly that their cause was just because God was on their side. So they marched and suffered and praised God and in some ways changed America forever. This surely was resisting faith in action. But even today, even today, we see enacted religious freedom at work in the black church. Ram Kanan, a leading political scientist at, at University of Pennsylvania, studied congregations in Philadelphia and found that black congregations were smaller, poorer, had less, fewer resources than white congregations, but that they served, on average, more people than white congregations did, and that the services that they provided were worth more than the services which were provided by white congregations. Now, white congregations were also, there were also fewer of them. Black congregations together provided over $90 million in free services to their communities, and this study was done in the, about 2009. So that would be even more now. But it's not just in Philadelphia. A national study of churches found that over 90% of black churches offer youth services, over 80% provide cash assistance, over 70% operate food pantries, over 65% carry out voter registration, and all of these are services being provided to their residents in their neighborhoods free of cost. This is not simply services provided to fellow congregants. They provide critical support for the poor and suffering in their community. And this work done by Sandra Barnes was followed up by another study where she connected these services to the kind of commitments, religious commitments, that people had. So this is being done, again, out of religious conviction. During the pandemic, black churches played an important role. They, at Mount Olive Baptist Church in East Knoxville, Tennessee, opened the first vaccination clinic in the predominantly black part of the city. And I think many people know that black people, Hispanics, were especially affected by the coronavirus, by COVID-19. And so it was really important to begin to get services into black neighborhoods. The church was a way to do that. In Gal Galilee Missionary Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, also got involved in addressing vaccine inequity issues. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in Middletown, Connecticut, hosted community discussions with health officials because there was also a lot of distrust that black people felt towards health officials. And so the church was a bridge. All of this, again, acting on religious commitment. To sum it up, enacted religious freedom, acting in a manner consistent with faith commitments, even when appeals to religious freedom are not expressly articulated by the actors, is the uh, concept I, I'm discussing. In situations where religious freedom is limited, individuals frequently self-censor, particularly when the price of religious action is high. However, some individuals act in, act in accordance with their faith regardless of the price as we saw in the case of Richard Allen.
But that's not really the image of religious freedom that comes to mind to the, in the general public. People aren't thinking about the power of Christian faith to work for justice and to serve the needy. Very often, instead, it's seen the opposite way around. So just in the middle of the 20th century, just about the same time as the civil rights uh, movement, we have this bitter racial oppression in the South, the Bible Belt, where so many white evangelicals lived. And in fact, there was outright resistance in some cases. So resistance to efforts by black Baptists to pursue racial justice in the South were sometimes explicitly couched in terms of religious freedom. So segregationist resistance to the Federal Fair Employment Practices Act of 1948 and its ban on racial discrimination in employment was based on defense of individual freedoms, including religious freedom because these were people who believed that God had created white people to be superior to black people. The Baptist Joint Committee, which maintained the connection between the Southern Baptist Convention and Northern Baptists, used their concern for ensuring continued religious freedom after the Second World War to avoid acting on a resolution made by black Baptists to include racial discrimination in the denomination's public affairs portfolio explicitly saying, because we have religious freedom and that's what we're focusing on, we can't work for racial justice. And this is what Martin Luther King Jr. says of moderate white pastors. I've heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is a law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I've watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irrelevances and sanctimonious trivialities. Too often, this is what the public thinks of when they think about religious freedom. There has been a kind of indifference to racial justice but the culture that we live in, this indifference among those who are champions of religious freedom, but the culture we live in seems to be going in a different direction. Now, I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom. My daughter likes to tell me that Job is my favorite book of the Bible. <laughs> but that's not true. I like Revelations, too. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, my favorite book, if I had a favorite book, would probably be the Gospel of Luke. He writes about justice. He writes Luke 4.18, which I must confess is my husband's favorite passage in the Bible. The spirit of the Lord is on me, for he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to declare the day of freedom for those who are in captive. That is Luke. And Luke has such a heart of compassion for women. Only Luke tells us that Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain, that he sees her pain. Nobody brings the widow of Nain to him. She doesn't come to him herself. He sees her pain. Her only son has died. She's a widow, and he raises her son from the dead. Yes, so I think Luke wins even over Job and Revelations. What's happening in the culture is actually growing support for racial justice. There were the massive, George Flo uh, massive protests following the death of George Floyd. In New York, in Boston, in Baltimore, in San Francisco, in Portland, in LA, in Atlanta, there were protests around the death of Tyree Nichols recently. And this is Boston in 2017. I don't know how many of you know Boston well enough to recognize the State House, that Golden Dome. But in Boston, which is known for its uh, racism, people poured out in 2017 following the incident in Charlottesville where that young woman was killed. There was some kind of planned demonstration in Boston in support of so freedom of speech, but everybody interpreted it really as defense of white supremacy. 
and tens of thousands, perhaps as many as 40,000 people took to the streets in Boston to stand up for racial justice. It's not just individuals though. Businesses are getting involved. So according to an article in the Texas Journal on Civil Liberties and Civil Rights, in response to the George Floyd protests, nearly 70% of 500 of the largest companies made statements in support of racial justice. More than a third provided financial donations to racial justice organizations and causes. Now, you know, some of that was skin deep and uh, those companies didn't follow through on promises. But there was the pressure for them to actually do something. And these are just illustrative uh, examples. And even before Juneteenth was declared a national holiday in 2021, Nike, Twitter, Target, General Motors, the National Football League, and a variety of other businesses observed the holiday. In popular culture, the work of African Americans is really, has, has had an important impact an astounding impact, especially among our young people. According to a study in the Journal of Data Science, rap and hip hop has enjoyed increasing popularity from the 1990s, as have some particular black artists like Drake or uh, um, The Pimp a Butterfly, Con Kendrick Lamar, thank you. Thank you. In, in 2018, hip hop and R&B became the most popular music genre according to the Nielsen Sound Scan. That year, nine out of 10 of the most consumed songs in the United States were hip hop or R&B tracks. And eight out of 10 of the most streamed artists were rappers. And streaming at that time was the most popular way to consume music. In another study that looked at uh, searches for touring artists, Hip hop tied for the first time. So I've been talking about hip hop and R&B together. Now this is just hip hop on its own. Hip hop, hip hop tied for the first time with pop music as the most searched for touring artist in the country. In 20 states, the most searched for artist was a hip hop artist. And Kendrick Lamar was the most popular artist in internet search in 2022. According to Vogue UK, Drake was another black uh, rapper, was Spotify's most streamed artist of the decade, with more than 28 billion streams, billion with a B. Our country is embracing black culture and is however imperfectly, I don't want to be naive about this, however imperfectly building support for, for racial justice. But sometimes I think that those of us who are on the side of religious freedom are, are using an eight track tape in a YouTube world. Remember those old eight track tapes? I know the young people don't know, but these, they were huge and you'd stick them in your player in your car to listen to music. But everybody else is listening to music, is streaming music on YouTube. We're still back there with an eight, eight track tape. Or we're listening to Pat Boone and Amy Grant when everybody else is listening to Drake and Lecrae. We're just completely out of step with the times. We need to be people of faith, acting on our religious beliefs, even when they're unpopular. So I'm not suggesting that we just roll over and give up on the deeply held beliefs. So we're definitely out of step here, right? Because support for, great ma and for gay marriage has risen enormously in the last couple of decades. And there is some political, religious overlap here. So white evangelicals and Republicans line up to support gay marriage. Black Christians fall in the middle. And there's, despite this huge support over the last 20 years, so in 2004, about one third of the population supported gay marriage. And by 2022, it was 61%. A huge increase. I'm not suggesting we just go with the culture, but there's this big partisan gap. In 2019, only 44% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents, and I should say this data is from Pew Research Center, and they 
so I, I can't report everything on all the categories, you know. They tend to, some things they will tell us what, they'll break it down by religious affiliation and some things they only give political affiliation, but there's a lot of overlap between the religious affiliation and the political affiliation. So in 2019, only 44% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents supported gay marriage versus 75% of Democrats and those who, independents who lean Democratic. I said that the, there's been a huge increase, but it hasn't changed much between 2019 and 2022. It's leveling off, except among blacks, who, are, who have grown more supportive. So typically, black people are not as liberal as Democrats and not as conservative as Republicans, but on this issue, black support is still growing. The percent of white evangelical Protestants who disapprove of gay marriage is in the same range as the share of Republicans who disapprove, 71% of evangelicals, and 62 to 66% of Republicans disapprove. Non-evangelical non Protestants take the opposite position. 62% favor gay marriage. Your main, mainline white churches. Black Protestants are divided on the issue. 49% are for gay marriage, 46% against. Gender identity. Another issue that Republicans oppose and where blacks have an ambiguous position is on gender identity. Black Democrats have more in common with the Republicans than white Democrats on this issue. So this is one of the telling things. Who says, you know, can you be a man though, they use this language of assign, the sex assigned you at birth as though it's not about your DNA. Um, but, but the language they use is, can you be different from the sex assigned to you at birth? You can see that support for that has actually been falling. That in 2022, 60% of the American population is saying that your sex has to be the same as what was assigned to you at birth. In other words, what your genitals and DNA indicate. That was only 54% in 2017. So there's a lot of support for it, but it's actually falling. So if you look at the bottom, 66% of Republicans and those who lean Republicans say we've gone too far on this issue of transgender ID. And 22% say it's been just about right among those who are Republican or lean Republican. And Democrats, 59% say that we haven't gone far enough. So there's a real split developing there. I'm not suggesting that we throw religious commitments to the winds. If, you have, if we have religious commitments around these issues, we have to buck the culture. If we have religious commitments, if we think that there is a biblical anthropology or if you, not, uh, if you are not one of the religions that accepts the Bible, if you think that there is a religious basis for believing that men and women are distinct and not interchangeable, we need to stick with that. But this is where the culture is on those issues. Here are the religious influences on views on transgenderism that 41% of people say that their views on transgenderism are affected by their religious commitment. So I can't disentangle what's political from what's religious, but you can see that religion is playing a big role and that there is this big partisan divide. Attitudes towards abortion. This is another issue where evangelicals and Republicans line up. The blacks, again, fall somewhere in the middle, but they are closer to Democrats on this issue than on the other two I just talked about. According to Pew, the opinions on the issue has been stable for several years, uh, and they did a survey as lately as 2022, but 84% of the nuns, that is those with no religious affiliation, support abortion with little or no restrictions. 61% of the general public agree with that. 74% of white evangelicals say that abor abortion should be illegal in most cases. And black Protestants are like the general public. 66% support abortion with few restrictions. In this case, ideology is as important as party affiliation because the gap between conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans is very similar to the gap between conservatives and Democrats. 
These are issues where we need to exercise our religious freedom and buck the culture if, in fact, that's what our convictions dictate. But there is an issue where we could actually gain some ground with the culture. And that is consistent with our faith beliefs. We could do more around racial justice. White evangelicals, and I can't speak, I, I, I don't know about the data on others, Mormons or Catholics who support uh, religious freedom, but white evangelicals deny the reality to a large extent of the systemic nature, nature of racial disadvantages. Michael Emerson and Christian Smith wrote a book, Divided by Faith, where they outline that white evangelicals are much more likely to say that when blacks are poor or in any way disadvantaged, it's because of their culture or because they don't work hard enough or the very famous one that I hear all the time, because of broken families. But the roots of those broken families, the systemic nature of the oppression, the fact that slaves were not allowed to marry legally so that black people came into freedom having to seek each other out and make, uh, having to go before uh, a priest or a preacher to, make the, to validate their marriages, that is not taken into account. There's a close link between poverty and marital instability. Black people are disproportionately poor. Again, a historic legacy. White evangelicals don't deal with that. I've just been given the sign for five minutes, so I'll just say that racial segregation is still an issue for us today. Douglas Massey, famous sociologist, I think Massey's at Princeton, wrote in 2016, almost one in three blacks living in metropolitan areas experienced hyper-segregation in 2010, though the proportion is down sharply from 1970 levels. Hyper-segregation. Whites only tolerate low levels of racial integration in their neighborhoods, he said. So if it's just like back at St. George's, when there are a lot of black people, suddenly the tolerance disappears according to Douglas Massey. Their preference to live away from blacks, according to Massey, is rooted in anti-black stereotypes. And what's closely related to this is educational inequality. That we have what sociologists call apartheid schools. That black kids go to poor schools. And poor schools don't educate them as well as wealthy schools. But because black people live in poor neighborhoods and can't move into the suburbs, they don't have access to the same level of schooling. Similarly, because of a lack of education, in part, I'm not trying to say it's the whole story, there has consistently, for the last two decades, been an unemployment rate among blacks, which is twice what it is among whites. Even at the best of times. So actually, right now, the white rate is 3.1%. Black unemployment rate is 5.4%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in January 2023. Not quite double, but close. What I'd like to see us do in defense of religious freedom and to advance it in the culture is to stand up for those commitments even when they're unpopular, but to recognize that religious commitments are around justice and service to the poor, and that if we could do more to, to be identified in the public eye as standing up for justice, as fighting for racial justice, as fighting for the poor, people would be more able to see the value of our religious commitments. And we need to get our young people involved it was showing what percentage of people have changed their position. I think it's close to 25% have changed their position and issue based on what they see on social media. Now, I'm way too old for social media. Maybe some of you in here are, you know, I know people my age who do social media, but I'm like, my children forbade it, right? When, when, um, when Facebook first came out, they're like, it's creepy for old people to be on Facebook. 
So they wouldn't allow us to be on Facebook and we've just never got the bug. But our young people, that's their native language. We need to get them talking about how we are using our religious freedom in defense of the poor and for justice so that we can catch up with the culture that's leading us and so that we can demonstrate the importance of our faith commitments. Thank you. I wanted to start with the first question. You introduced this idea of enacted uh, religious liberty. Yes. Um, could you give us just a working definition of what that is in a sentence? That, I think that will help guide maybe the Q&A a little bit. Okay. It is acting on deeply held religious beliefs, assuming the freedom to do so. Is that good? Excellent. Yes, thank you, that was perfect. Um, okay, we have time for q and I and maybe another student will pass around a mic. Uh, your questions for Dr. Rivers. Do you want to introduce yourself and then? I'm Lisa Halverson and I'm a Civic Research Fellow here at the Center. Um, Tomorrow, my American government students are, well, tonight, they're reading Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. And so we'll be talking about it tomorrow. And as you talked about this enacted religious freedom and you quoted King, I don't know, did that quote come from letter from Birmingham yes. jail? Or, because it's very similar yes. to what he says in the letter. Yes, it is. It is a quote from the letter from a Birmingham jail. Okay, where he's frustrated at these white Christian pastors saying, just wait, just slow down. And he says, no, this is time for direct action, which I think is very similar to your kind of enacted religious yes. freedom, right? That direct action, exactly. that fighting for their rights, that that they believed, I mean, just as human beings, but also as religious human beings, seeing themselves as children of God, you know, this... So I don't, I don't know what my question is. I guess, were you teaching that letter tomorrow? What would you wo most want your students to get from it, to recognize in it? I would most like them to ask, is this me? Is this me? Yes. Am I one of those white pastors? Or am I ready? Because it's really important to acknowledge that the civil rights movement, there were lots of white students who left the North and went to the South and put their lives on the line. And uh, uh, two died. Goodman and Schwerner died for their beliefs. Am I prepared to stand up for justice? Am I, and, and I don't think this is just about race. I think when I got to Harvard as an undergraduate, I went to um, HRCF, Harvard Radcliffe Christian Fellowship, and I had only become a Christian at 19. And I'd been taught that Jesus turns your world upside down, that he radicalizes, radical. Now, how many people think of Jesus as radical? He radicalizes your beliefs. Which Jesus are they following? Are they following the Jesus who radicalizes their beliefs, or are they following a safe, just wait, don't do anything, Jesus? That's what I'd like them to take from the letter. Thank you. Other, other questions? I'm a loud speaker. <laughs> just for the recording, I'll give it to you. Anyways. Yeah, thank you. How is the evangelical movement today among the black culture? Is it as strong, not as strong? So I talked about the founding of the first black right. uh, mm -hmm. denomination. And someone asked me at dinner, at lunch today, so black church, um, I think it was Professor Hancock, what do you mean by the black church? And very often when scholars talk about the black church, they're talking about five to seven historically black denominations, which are, I guess, evangelical, because they grew out of this uh, Second Great Awakening and the work of Baptists and Methodists, in particular some Presbyterians as well. So the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Afri African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the Church of God in Christ, uh, the Christian Methodist Church, and a 
variety of different Baptist churches. And those continue to be very strong. Uh, according to Pew, something like 85% of all black people identify as Christians. Um, I might have that figure a little high, but it's no less than 70%. And even among black people who identify as nuns, that is, they're not affiliated with any religion, have high levels of prayer, daily prayer, believe in the existence of God, and even read the Bible. So Christian faith is very much alive and well in the black community. But certainly we also, like most other churches, have seen uh, some attrition among our young people that we have, we're losing young people from the black church. Yeah, I, I really appreciate how you pointed out how religion was the central core factor in the abolition, you know, abolition of slavery. Absolutely, and, and among Martin blacks King, and whites. I've been, you know, at the Pettus Bridge and the AME Church and have seen, you know, so many wonderful sights. And I, I always thought to myself, I wish every black and every white student could come here and see and feel this and have that desire to recognize every, every human being as a child of God because that's how, that's what they were seeking. Exactly. And, and I think the black community needs to remember that too. Yeah. And, and that is why uh, it's so important what we teach in our schools because it would be, every student should be learning that. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. In some southern schools, you know, the myth of the lost cause is still what's on the curriculum. We're just debating this. <laughs> <laughs> We're both feeling shy, so it doesn't matter. It's okay, I promise I left my teeth at home, I won't bite. <laughs> um, so our professor, uh, told us to do like uh, reading assignments, like reflections about some uh, political matters. Mm -hmm. um, so one of those was about um, African slavery um, and Joe's the idea of America 1690 project. And so I, but when I was listening to you, it just came to my mind so strongly and it just makes me like, gives me chills that, um, Hannah Jones was talking about um, um, her father. Oh yes, that I'm trying to try to see if I find uh, so the she, quote. in her opening essay she says that her father flew the American flag. And no, that yes, but also like um, I can't find it, but <clears throat> um, and it says that uh, the the father is like it. Sorry, <laughs> uh, the. He joined the military and serving the, this country, so people around him will recognize him as an American, as a person of value. Yes. And I, I really felt really sad when I wrote, like I read that because he was a really valuable person in this country, and he fought for this country. And I felt that connection because I'm also an immigrant, and to feel that and to think that we always strive to fit in mm -hmm. and to try to do everything we can so everybody will see us like an American and somebody of value and somebody that can contribute to this country. It is sad because it would, shouldn't be um, judged by who, where you are from, but how you are as a person, value as a human being. Absolutely, and that's another issue that uh, we could take on for demonstrating our commitment to justice as uh, people of faith, because um, scriptures teach us that we should protect the stranger. And, you know, thank God that is a strong uh, theme in the Catholic Church, but there's another place where we need to demonstrate the value of religious commitment. Okay, so you talked a lot about I talked about a lot, a lot about a lot of things, but one thing that stood out to me is when you started discussing our youth. For me, I have a lot of concerns for the rising generation and of what they're being taught and the things they're being influenced with. So, as you are working on creating equality and just helping people feel loved and to further this re religion and mm -hmm. continuing this in our day, what how are you reaching our youth? How are you reaching even the younger generations before that of 
like before they're even out of the home. How, how have you been working oh, on I this? I think that that's an excellent question. And uh, I do it in a very limited way. Uh, I've mentioned to people that we do a program in the summer for middle school students. And really the focus there is on math and language arts because I think, you know, much like feeding the hunger in Philadelphia, we need to be working to improve the lives of kids who are suffering. And we run a program year round for high school students, uh, really teaching them about black history and uh, it's co-sponsored with Harvard University so they get the opportunity to be on campus every week and to meet with Harvard professors so that they have role models. These are the things that we're doing with youth but I'd really like to see us doing more. And that's why I say that you young people are the key because you have the way, you can reach them through social media in a way in which I can't. You can begin to talk directly to your peers and to the next generation. You really can do it much better than I can. Thank you. Well, that's the conclusion of our time together. Please join me in thanking Dr. Rivers uh, for her presentation. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. <laughs>